All right, it is 1.30, so let's get started. Um, this is Evergreen Data Work 101 with Chris Sharp. And before we get started, I want to thank our conference sponsors, Emerald Data Networks, Equinox Open Library Initiative, and Mobius. And without further ado, Chris, take it away. Okay, <laughs> I'll start over. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you to the sponsors. Um, uh, this session was born out of a, um, a period when I had a number of, of help desk tickets that were in my queue um, that all seemed to be doing similar sort of data update requests um, at, all at the same time. And I thought, you know, I was kind of kicking around the idea of doing a session um, and and this this came to mind. Um, and then my wife, my uh, my life sort of went south. <laughs> my personal life sort of went crazy. I'm not going to get into details, but I I um, I have put together this session. Um, and it's funny because at one point I had to remember. Uh, oh yeah, I did volunteer for something. So anyway, here we are. Data work 101. Um, 101 indicating that while this is you know a technical audience um, session. It's meant to be introductory and not, um, not you know, exclusive to people who are already doing this, hopefully. I think really the people who are already doing it don't need it. Um, so hopefully that this is, a, uh, this is a useful session. So what I decided to do, uh, rather than list off the many, many, many aspects of data work that I do as a system administrator for Pines, uh, was to focus in on a single ticket that I got a couple of years ago um, and sort of use it as, an, as a use case, an example of the process and the way you might go about thinking about a data project that comes to you. And it's probably pretty typical. So, um, all right, so we had a cataloging request. We are working to simplify the shelving locations across the branches in our regional libraries to improve the ability to run reports, to improve readability for the visually impaired, and to improve and to remove abbreviations. That is all a noble goal. And uh, she had attached the old locations and proposed new locations, um, and uh, gave some examples. And they were hoping to do this <clears throat> without having local staff have to touch it. Um, <clears throat> so this is a pretty common request uh, to do something like this. Now, in this case, this is a large regional system with uh, tens of thousands of items uh, per shelving location. And <clears throat> it is... Um, this is a person who is very competent, who had sort of inherited uh, kind of a messy situation and was trying to modernize it. Um, so this is the proposal that she gave me. I hope that's large enough for you to view on your screen. Um, if not, the slides will be available later, but this is a screenshot of her spreadsheet. Um, and as you can see, they did a lot of planning and thinking this out. Um, this, I chose this example um, because it was so well planned on their end. Um, as a, anybody who does this for any length of time, you learn that not every site is going to be so thoughtful. And um, we've had to have like, you know, long discussions. I remember there was another very large library system in Pines that had almost this exact same request, except they also were using um, statistical categories and some other things. And they had a, like this very complicated matrix. And it actually involved us traveling to the library and having in-person meetings to figure out what the heck they were talking about. So this kind of thing is, is very good um, and can be used maybe as an example for you and your libraries if y'all are having similar conversations. Okay, so the first question is, do we, the system administration staff, need to be involved at all? Because after all, we defer to library expertise. We believe that they know their jobs and their collections better than we do. And that when we 
um, enter the process that we might be making some wrong assumptions uh, as every single library system and, and indeed in some cases different catalogers in the same system have different subtle changes between workflows and assumptions and things like that. Um, so like really it's it's kind of counterintuitive but you know that the you know technical expert each sort of people with evergreen shouldn't be doing this kind of work but really because all of the above is true it is better if the staff themselves do the changes if you know if possible because they know they know what they want to do and um so can they do it themselves let's see what are the options for staff people in Evergreen to do something themselves? Now the staff client offers a couple of ways that you can do this. I'm just gonna highlight one and a cataloger will probably, you know, if you wanna correct me, just throw it in the comments <laughs> about the best way to do this. But the way I would think to do it is that you would run a report to generate the list of barcodes you wanna change. You're identifying those barcodes. Uh, you load those into the item status screen and then you make them into a bucket. And then within the bucket, you can batch change those items however you want to. Um, I did a test file on one of our low power test servers running um, Concerto this morning about a 50 uh, barcode file, just to sort of see, you know, extrapolate how long that would take to to do um <laughs> and it was pretty slow even even with that small amount so but the pros of this are it's available to staff and it works for small batches i'm guessing around 200 somebody might correct me about that um i i you know i know our cataloging staff are encouraged to keep this sort of thing under probably 100 or you know maybe 200 items at a time um and then even then you are talking about less than 500 okay so that's that's a good that's good to know guys thank you so much um so like to change a 10,000 item file you would have to do 50 batches of 200 um or you know 200 batches of 50 <laughs> like i did and that you know that's somebody's full-time job for a while if that's what you're doing um and that that's not reasonably worth it um, so it can be very slow and it has to be done in very small bites so the in built-in tools in the staff client aren't really going to cut it for what's necessary with this kind of thing so they can't do it now what all right <clears throat> before you do any data work at all ever it is very important that you know what the data is now i'm sure i'm echoing and repeating some things that rogan was talking about in his session yesterday about um, sql for librarians um, and i did mention in that session that uh, that was probably a good compliment to my session um, so really though before you're even getting into sql or anything you just want to talk to the libraries um, okay good right so it's good to have maybe, if not hard policies of the number of items, then you know maybe a, a guideline or recommendations. Um, if every librarian out there tried to do, you know, two thousand barcodes in item status at the same moment, you might expect system problems, for instance, and that's that's not great. Um, you would want it to happen in a batch behind the scenes. Okay, so, but to get back to this, understanding from the library what needs to be changed. As technical staff, we often are kind of in our hidey holes and aren't talking to um, the staff directly, um, you know, maybe through help desk tickets. But in some cases, this might mean a phone call, honestly, and just, you know, hey, what what's, what's the story behind this? What's the end goal, et cetera, et cetera? Is it worth it? You know, I've had some of these conversations end with the decision that it just doesn't make sense to do a certain project or to do it the way they had envisioned. Um, but a phone call really helps. I'm, I'm seeing an amen from Jeremy on that. Um, so the second question 
that I sort of get to is how do we identify the items they want us to be changing for them? And more to the point, how do we tell Postgres how to do that? Uh, Postgres is, um, as we know, the database program underlying Evergreen. Um, and you have to be able to develop an SQL query that will change the things you want to change. Um, and Rogan's making a point that I thought of and did not put in my presentation, but really every help desk ticket is a reference interview. Um, I was once a reference librarian. Uh, it was one of my favorite things to do. I loved reference. And uh, I used to have a training called the question behind the question. And that um, that was meant to, because some somebody comes up and they say, I want to do this. And you can answer them on the face, you know, on its face, what it sounds like they're asking, but that's probably not going to get them what they actually want. It's probably not going to achieve what they're actually trying to achieve. So yes, a reference interview with the person who wants this is a good way to think of it for librarians. Okay, so how do we identify the, this? Does it make sense for the library staff to identify the items for, for, for us instead of them kind of giving us parameters and then we have to go find them. And I say most of the time the answer to that is yes. It is. It makes more sense for the library staff to do that. Well, but shouldn't sysadmins, you're the tech people. Why do we, why do we have to figure that part out? And really we can do that, but it is almost always not worth the time that it involves developing queries. And just, just so you know why um, that is, I, I assume people in this group know this, but when you're doing uh, SQL queries where you're trying to find things with a lot of different parameters, it's it, it can sometimes get into the realm of regular expressions, which are you know almost their own programming language to find certain things. Um, it, it can become very, very complex, very fast, and it's just easier. And again, it goes back to the uh, first point I made about why why should we do this at all? Because they know it better. They know this um, better than we do. So once you have identified the items, or in this case, had the library identify those items, look at the items. Like to take anything on face value when you're doing this is a mistake. And Yes, I think John is making a similar point. Um, run a list for the library, have them confirm before doing any actual work. Yes, yes, I am I am doing a similar process here. So when you're looking at these items, you need to look for patterns, any data entry problems, human or machine errors that might get in your way or, or become gotchas, um, glaring logical problems. Like this, this is sometimes the point where you get back on the phone with them and are like, um, this doesn't really make sense now that we're really looking at it uh, for for us to do it this way. Um, in this case, this is a well thought out situation, but you know, I I, I don't have a great example of, of one that doesn't doesn't make sense uh, at hand. So once you figured all this stuff out, then we can start actually doing the technical stuff that we all love want to do uh, and love doing. So testing, use a test server. But wait, I don't have a test server. Stop everything else until you have a test server. So um, when I say test server, I don't mean a single little you know, virtual machine running on your laptop with Concerto on it. I'm talking about something that is as production-like as possible. Um, in Pines, we actually take a, a copy, we do a PG dump of the database, a, a, a full copy of the database, excluding some of the tables we don't need. Um, and then we just load that into our test servers so that we're actually working with real data. The problem with Concerto is really not that it's small. The problem with Concerto is it doesn't have the, the, the errors. It doesn't have the real life messy data that exists in a real database that's sort of been migrated 20,000 times over 25 years that, you know, and, and in our case is containing 50 different systems with that kind of data. Um, so, you know, that that's really it. So having a test server is required. 
Okay, so importing the files from library staff. So this is all assuming that we have told library staff to create those files. So in this case, um, I had asked the cataloger, okay, for each of the, the um, shelving location changes, please create me a file. And that file would have a certain number of fields, but the most important, of course, is the barcode. And I just trust, you have to trust that they know what they're doing in that regard. You, you know, there's, um, I think there's something I say later, trust but, but, but verify that saying, I believe Ronald Reagan said that. Uh, I don't usually quote Reagan, but uh, here we go. Um, so how, how do we import files from library staff? This is just a technical detail that I think is important for people to know. Um, Postgres uh, in the PSQL uh, command line actually um, provides a copying mechanism where you can tell it to copy a file into your database, like a, a CSV. Um, so you want to create a DB schema that's sort of your working schema. In this example, I'm just going to call the schema working. Okay. Um, and then you need to create a table that's going to hold the data the library provided. And in this case, I'm assuming it's just a, a text of plain barcodes. But it could be a, 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 a file with, you know, title, author, barcode, uh, price, whatever that the library has. And from my perspective, it doesn't make a lot of sense to get too picky about that because you don't like while we want them, I, I feel like we've asked them to do enough work at this point. And this, you know, um, as a person who's doing data work, you want to be able to sort of accept the data in whatever form it is given to you, um, you know, it, as much as possible. I mean, if it's just ridiculous, then then that's another issue. But in this case, this is a competent cataloger who understands what's needed. Um, so create a table. Um, that this would create a table. I, I usually name my tables with the date so that when I'm going back to see what tables I can drop for cleanup, um, I just know, oh yeah, that's super old. I can get rid of it just at a glance. If you call it library import <laughs> and five years later, you're like, huh, when was that? You know, it, it, it makes it a little more difficult. Um, so this is assuming that you're dealing with a CSV file um, that has a header. But this is an example of the command. Um, once you've created that table, you can say copy the table from the file, and then it gives you a couple of extra arguments you can give it. You can tell it this is a CSV file, and it has a header. Okay, so that and header means it actually literally says barcode at the top of the line. Um, if it didn't say barcode and was just a plain file, you can just leave that header part off and it will import it. If you leave header off and there is a header, it will import the header row as part of the data. So it will just have a barcode in there that says barcode. Um, so of course, as I say, adjust your columns and header settings to suit. Um, one DB table per file. Uh, that just, that keeps things sane <laughs> to me. Like, so for example, library import is not a very descriptive name. If I were going to be doing a real file, I would probably call it something like MGRL, um, easy reader to something and then the date, something like that. Uh, just, just something to give me enough clues that what we're talking about. Um, and I'll also just mention that and in, in again, in that spirit of not making the libraries do more work than they need to, pretty much everybody in, who works in libraries who deals with this knows how to use Excel. Not everybody knows how to convert to a CSV file. So there are plenty of tools that admins can use to do that, either um, honestly just putting it in you know, Excel or, or uh, LibreOffice or something like that and saying export as will do the job. Um, but there are also command line tools that you can use. So that's getting a little bit in the weeds, but I think it's important, an important detail because like when I first started doing this stuff, I didn't really understand that you could import a file directly like this. So I, you know, <laughs> I'm throwing that in here again. This is a 101 course. Okay, so more testing. Um, at this point, what I do is sort of a basic count of like, okay, we saw how many files, how many rows got imported from the file. Let's do a quick check of 
how many non-deleted barcodes match what's in that file. Okay, if that's way off, you know something's wrong. Um, maybe they gave you a, a wrong file, or when they did their report, they forgot to do a deleted uh, um, filter, something like that. So that just sort of gives you a, a smoke test that this is correct. Um, and another important thing in this particular instance is checking that the shelving locations e exist at each target library. Now that might just be a Pines thing, but the way we're set up, um, generally if there's system level cataloging, all of the branches have the same names for their shelving locations. That's kind of an assumption that we have across the, the, the way. I mean, there's some, um, exceptions to that probably, but but generally there's going to be, you know, adult fiction and juvenile fiction. And if they're named consistently, that helps for the catalogers who are doing this from a, uh, from a central spot to not have to worry too much. Um, but it's possible when they're creating new shelving locations that they forgot the little branch that's out here, you know, God love them. They're just always the last one on the list and nobody remembers they exist. Well, you know, they're also in the file because, you know, computers know about the stuff that we forget about. Um, again, there's my Reagan quote, trust but verify. Uh, good, good rule to keep in mind here. Uh, bounce any missing locations back to the library staff. So really the best thing to know about this is it's always going to be a conversation. Um, this is rarely a situation where you just sort of get your data and you just go to work. You're going to have to have a a back and forth and a back and forth. Um, hopefully this is somebody you get along with because you'll be having a lot of conversations with them. Now, the next step is to develop the actual query. So let's put in a query. So this is my example query and you SQL people, see if you can identify a possible flaw with this. So I say, update the copy table, set the location, from the subquery, select the ID from the copy location. Oh, I don't don't pay attention to the naming here. <laughs> that that's a, actually an error. The the error I'm thinking about is. Well, does anybody have a guess aside from this business with CL? Just ignore the CL part, the CL name. That's that's an obvious one. <laughs> well, Rogan found another typo. The name in the owning library, exactly. So closing parens, thank you. That was that was a, that was a real mistake. The intentional mistake was that I left the owning library off of the uh, the copy location. Um, that that's a if you deal with this enough, you you would have recognized that. Okay, so. In this case, I actually had to rethink how I did this because I started writing that query for real and I was like, well, wait a minute, how, okay, this is a file that has all kinds of things from all different libraries. How am I gonna separate those out? Here is one way to do it. There may be better ways, but this is one way. So what I do here, um, this is, this is again, the, it's a technical presentation, so we have code on the screen. Okay, so this backslash A black backslash T says, I want my format to be unaligned, meaning that we it doesn't need to look pretty, it just needs to be rows, and remove the tuple headers for this. So this is just gonna be data. And then I say, I want to output this to library updates.sql, and then I select this text, update asset copy set location equals da 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 da, um, and owning lib, and then I append the circlib here, and then I append where ID equals the ID here from asset copy where barcode is from the table. So that is, um, so Brad Bradley is suggesting a different method Oh, that too. <laughs> so yeah, the, the cheat would be basically rename the rename the co the uh, copy locations from the from the database. And the, anyway, um, I'll let Bradley explain that if y'all want to know. So here, um, if I tend, I want to do everything I do here. Remember, we're still on a test server, but I still want to put this in a transaction. So I start begin 
which starts a transaction. And then I input the file we just created, which should give me like 40,000 lines of updates or whatever. No, that's okay. <laughs> and then commit. Um, alternatively, you can add those to the actual file library updates.sql that, that has been created. You can just go in, add, begin at the beginning and commit at the end. Um, alternatively, if you're testing, whoops, if you're testing, you can hit, um, you can change commit to rollback, um, which just lets you see if there's going to be any errors uh, in your SQL. And sometimes there are. Rollback just sort of makes it so that the whole thing fails if anything fails. That's why you do transactions. So that's what begin and commit me means. If you do begin and commit, that puts it in what's called a transaction that lets you roll back any, the whole thing if anything goes wrong. Uh, important thing to do. You can also, as you're starting PSQL, you can tell it that you want everything to be in a transaction. So it will do this automatically for you. Okay. Does this make sense? Do I, does anybody have questions about what I did here? It's okay if you really don't know. <laughs> okay, I uh, will continue. So what this has done is it created, I don't know, let's just assume there are 40,000 in the lo location we're trying to change, 40,000 items. It creates 40,000 lines that say update asset copies, select, set the location where the location is actually the right one for the circle that the copy belongs to. Um, and that way we have a clean set of update statements. And you have the file that you use to do this so you can go back to it. So now we want to actually take what we did on our test server and we did, um, you know, we tested and everything and we want to do it for real. So you always want to do something to back up. Um, think about all the times when you've made a mistake and you have no way to back up before you do anything like this. <laughs> and you will realize how valuable a, a, a way to revert your change is. So a quick way to do that might be for this example, since we're just changing location for each of these items, you could just copy this the ID and the location um, from all the items that you're about to change into another table. So that way you have the old location associated with the ID, the copy ID, and you can just put it, put it back. It's very easy to put it back the way it was. Um, so, oh, you know what? I, that's still not quite right too. You would, do, you would do the select query, but right here you would do into and then another cop, another uh, table where you would be storing things. I'm sorry, there's just a, a few typos in my, you know, I actually did go through this, but anyway. <laughs> but that, that allows you to back out the changes that you, that you had. I'll correct these slides before I put them out there for the world. Exactly, Rogan, you're you're exactly right. That's when you find your typos. It's also true that that's how you find bugs is you stick your uh, stick your program in production, right? So then you created that file in your test environment. If it is actually the same data, like recent enough that it has all the same items, you can just run what you created in your test environment, or you can go back and do this exact same process on production. So either way you want to do it. And then after running one file, not all 20 files, like you saw how big that spreadsheet was where there were all of the different um, changes that we're going to be making. After you've run that one file, check back with your cataloger. Is this working? Is this what you wanted? Do some spot checks of what we've done. And then once you've uh, done that, rinse, repeat. Basically, you go through this entire process for each one, um, and all the while you were checking back in with the cataloger. Hey, I did these updates. 
can you check that for me? They'll tell you if something's wrong. And even if you've done it five times, sometimes the, the librarian will come back and say, hey, you know what? That last one you did didn't work right for some reason. So, um, and Bradley's recommending backing up to a file for long term. You can do that too. Um, all right. So, after you've done all this, one of the best things, one of the, the advantages that you'll get from this is that you can learn from your mistakes because you're going to make them. And creating backups is, is a way to safeguard against that. But even, even creating backups, sometimes you can make, make mistakes. Um, and you learn the most from them. Like I, the, this whole uh, process comes from years of doing it wrong and figuring out better ways to do what I used to do in a really kind of roundabout way. Um, and um, document, document your process, because if you don't, you're going to get the same request in a year and you won't remember what you did. You can think you will, but if you don't remember it, you're having to do all that work again. And that, that is a very frustrating thing for a developer or an admin to have to like rethink out all the way that's, that you developed what you did. Um, and really, if it seems like something you're gonna do over and over again, you might consider creating a script that does this sort of thing. Now that gets to a point of diminishing returns, honestly, uh, because you might, it might like in that situation, the example situation we're using, that is that is kind of a one-off. You might have another library that does a similar thing, but it might not be exactly the same thing. So you can't just build one tool that's going to rule them all. Um, so, but it is a good point that when you do this sort of thing, this is where the tools are born. You sort of realize that you're dealing with uh, these sorts of things over and over again. Okay, so speaking of tools, sometimes you don't have to build it yourself. Somebody else has done something like this before and you can get some help. Um, and really this, this point too, not every data work ticket needs to be a learning opportunity. <laughs> you can just do it because you need to get it out of the way. Um, you know, that there's, there's just a lot we're all busy, right? We all have our day jobs and sometimes you just want to get it done and, and move on. Um, so I've got some links here um, that are not clickable for you, but uh, I can share my uh, my slides in a second. You can click them. Um, so on the main Evergreen Git, we have the Pines Contrib repo, which is basically my, I, I was going to say dumping ground. I thought holding place is a little nicer, but I'll say dumping ground for our Pines tools where we just sort of, if we have something like this that we've done, I know I want to remember it, I just shove it in this Git repo um, and it's done. It's kind of a mess, but it's there. Um, I'm, I'm going to call out a couple of uh, people that I think are in the room. Bill Erickson uh, has a Git repo that's worth checking out. Uh, a lot of his is development, but there are um, several evergreen utility type things around there too. The Equinox uh, contrib repo, I think this is, Rogan probably did a lot of this. Uh, so these are going to be tools for um, third party integration, but there are other tools in there as well. And Rogan may speak up and say something about that. Um, really, the, we use in Pines, we use both Edelweiss and Collection HQ uh, tools from this repo, and it's, it's really useful. Um, and then Jason Stevenson has done a number of useful data um, data update scripts. Uh, he's very fluent in Perl and is able to use uh, write scripts that are very good for just getting this kind of stuff done. Um, <clears throat> and I will just sort of, okay, so um, yeah, Rogan's giving another link. I wanted to sort of throw the question out there. Are there others I'm forgetting? Or these are just the ones I use all the time or reference. Um, so if, if you have links to share, just drop them in the chat and, and let people um, let people get there. Let me see. Bum, ba, dum. 
So there's, okay, so Mobius has some. Here comes the Pines link. Uh, here comes Phil's GitHub. Here comes the EOLI uh, link and Jason Stevenson's repo. So I'm putting those so you can click on those and take a look as well. Um, so that, that walks through my main example, um, but I did want to mention that we have, the, I mean, this kind of work is done all the time. We have patron updates. We have um, financial updates where like we've had libraries, I'm sure you've had this too, libraries going finds free. Um, Jason Stevenson has a couple of tools that, that I've used that have been great for that, that I'm, I'm willing to share, but I think he might have them in his GitHub too. I think some of those exist in, in the uh, gists. Um, good. I'm glad everybody's sharing these tools because these are, these are really, this is the beauty of being in a community is that we can all share this kind of stuff because our jobs are basically the same. The setup might be the same for each of our libraries, but the software is the same and, you know, a lot of us are contracting with Backstage. A lot of us are use, have libraries using Edelweiss or Collection HQ or uh, some other, you know, or, or are doing finds, fee, finds free or amnesty style projects. Um, there's, um, I, I'm going to have to do some data work coming up um, with the end of the fiscal year. We're going to be changing our long overdue period from 180 days to 90 days, which makes way more sense. Um, and, uh, but that means that we're going to have to change a number of those. We're gonna have to back batch some of the ones that should have been processed already, basically, as we do that. So figuring out tools there to mark long overdue, I'm pretty sure we have some at hand. Um, I know that Jason has an auto mark lost thing that I've used before. Um, but yeah, we've had we've had libraries go completely fines free and um, amnesty all of their fines. So they like complete a clean slate. That's what they call it, a clean slate program where they have um, forgiven everybody's fines. And so that that's challenging. You actually can't just go in there and delete billing rows. That's a recipe for awfulness. Um, so you do have to think through how these tools are done. And some of them go through Evergreen's, um, Evergreen's mechanisms. Uh, and some of them are done outside of Evergreen through the just direct connection with Postgres using Perl, or even just as my example does, straight command line for the database, uh, or Bash, um, or, you know, there are connectors for Python and Ruby and, you know, all kinds of languages that you can use to, to write these sorts of tools. Um, so uh, I'll open the floor to both questions and suggestions. I went through that a little faster than I intended, but um, would it, and, and by the way, we have seven slots for people if they want to join the um, join the video. Uh, if Catherine can let people in, uh, then you can join the conversation directly, or you can just keep keep it in chat. But I'm sure I've I've gotten some some wheels turning. Correcting patron ad address data. We have done a project in the past where we <clears throat> got um, we had unique management actually. Um, they use the uh, in the change of address in COA database that the post office uses um, to um, do a patron update. In that process for us, we sent our patron database to them. Uh, they processed it and sent it back to us. They put that into um, a schema in the database, uh, or we, we inserted their data in the database in, in its own schema. And then we did um, matching. Uh, well, they did the matching, and we they sent us what they thought the matches were. Um, it created a huge headache that kind of lasted for years, where the the matching wasn't exactly right. In our case, you know, we're most of the state of Georgia, 
So there can be a Christopher Joseph Sharp, you know, that's me, and there can be a Christopher Joseph Sharp that's in South Georgia, and we might even have the same birthday. And that <laughs> that was pretty remarkable to see how many people with the same name were born the same day. Um, but Stuart, if you have details, we might be able to give you more advice. Uh, I can just tell you how our how our situation went. Oh, oh, Blake's got something that he, you might be able to look, take a look at. Yes. Um, one of the things that you will find when you do any form of data cleanup is the human error of data entry. Just It's just rife with data entry problems. Um, you'll have Bluffton, you'll have space, 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 Bluffton, you'll have Bluffton, space, 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 garbage characters. I mean, it, it, it really does get interesting. Um, yeah, that's right. The biggest enemy to clean data is humans. Somebody needs to put that in the Pine Spot quotes. Um, it's true. Exactly. Our our systems are absolutely pristine and perfect until people start using them, right? Or developing it. <laughs> yeah, Bradley, that that was our experience to a point. I mean, I I, I think our um, our situation with Unique was was. Um, worth doing, but there was a lot of headache about bad matches. Um, if you dig into that Pines Contrib repo, you'll see one where I did an unmerge, <laughs> which doesn't really unmerge anything, but it, it it was able to get some of that data back from their tables. So yes, any, any sort of abbreviation for fort or street or saint or yes, exactly. Thank you, Catherine. Any other questions? Thank you, Blake. Gina, we do not have a practice guide that I'm aware of, but um, you might talk with uh, Don Dale at Pines, or um, one of one of us might be able to give you some tips. We do have some training materials that that are in an online um, platform that we host. Okay, if there are no further questions, I will uh, leave it, I'll hand it back to Catherine and um, she'll tell you what's next. And I appreciate your attention today and I, I hope it's been helpful. Um, I'm happy to talk about any of this stuff later on. Just uh, let me know. All right, thank you, Chris. And Chris, will you stick around a little bit and see if maybe if there are any other questions that pop up? um maybe in the chat yes i will um, thank you um okay coming up next on this track is at 3 30 what we wish we knew then getting started with acquisitions um for right now from 2 30 to 3 we have a break slash exhibitor time and then at three o'clock there's going to be lightning talks